and thank you so much for joining us today for the webinar Update Carries Management. It is a great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Jan Kunisch. His aim during this presentation will be to provide an update on the current status of modern cariology, starting from infection to diagnostics and ends with suggestions on an indication-oriented therapy and its consequences for the daily practice. We would like to thank Professor Jan Kunisch for being with us today and our sponsor CAVO for making this lecture possible. Please take note of any questions and comments you have during the lecture as they will be addressed by the professor at the end of the presentation. Without any further delay, please help me welcome the expert himself, Jan Kunisch. Yeah, thank you very much for this nice introduction. I would like to welcome you as well, dear friends, dear colleagues. Um, and the topic was given by Mr. Cavallo and I would like to give you an update in carries management. And maybe for those who don't know me, I will give you some facts about myself. Um, okay. So now it's in the right way. Maybe uh, I've got a dentist 20 years ago and today I'm more or less um, responsible for the pedo department in our dental school. And this means I'm dealing with children day by day with children and adults with any disabilities, it means we have to help patients with special needs. Looking a little bit on my scientific perspective, um, I'm more or less a clinical careologist and my special specialties are care diagnostics and most importantly prevention at all, um, as I deeply believe in the potential to prevent any carious lesions and to help our patients with sound teeth and health at all. So it is quite clear that I would like to provide a preventive perspective today. And it's I've learned over the years that it's important to know what the people are doing, are doing day by day. The agenda for our webinars um, are four points. I would like to give you an introduction um, regarding the current understanding of dental carriers. The second part will be to talk about modern carries detection and diagnostic methods, what is used and what is useful um, to do in clinical practice, um, especially also in children, where we need um, a fast approach and an efficient approach. And I also want to know where the carries lesions are located at which extent. The main part of my presentation is dedicated to current carries management strategy strategies and the main questions, the main question is remaining at all since 2004, how clean should the cavity be? And I can tell you that it is linked with many, many more questions today. And um, I would like to give a short overview about the controversies, controversies which um, will be there. And finally, I would like to give you an intention what we are doing with our patients. What is the preventive management of caries? active and carries risk patients. Um, and finally, I would like to summarize my presentation of the webinar. What are the current perspectives in, the, in understanding dental carriers? I would like to give you a short overview where we are in Germany. Um, what we have seen over the last, over the past more or less four decades and the recent, the most recent numbers were published this year and um, I can tell you that, that today we are here um, at, the, at the number of 0 0.5 DMF. And if you have a look where we are, came from, then it's very clear that there is a caries decline. And uh, this is related to different methods. Of course, fluoride toothpaste are playing an important role. Um, then preventive dental care was established uh, at the end of the 80s, last century. Fissure sealing uh, was introduced. And of course, um, the people think about um, prevention of dental caries, and a lot of dentists provide preventive dental care. And that these are the major reasons uh, why we are um, on a so good uh, oral and dental health today. And my feeling is that the story is not coming to an end. We have to safeguard um, to be there where we are uh, now. 
But nevertheless, beside this um, very positive trend, it has to be pointed out that we will see carriers. And unfortunately, we do see carriers in children. And that's unfortunately in our daily business that we see um, carriers in the primary dentition. We know that the D component um, at, at the age of six is quite high and more or less each second child today has dental carriers anymore. And furthermore, that's another important information if we would like to include non-cavitated carious lesions, which means brown discolorations or white spot lesions on the, um, on the smooth surfaces, which are located here, then the number of carious-free children is decreased dramatically. And I can tell you maybe at the age of 10, um, the numbers from our studies that we will have only 20-25% children percent of the population, which is really carries free. And this means there's a long way ahead of us um, to get many, many more carries free children, adolescents and adults. And of course, a big problem, a big challenge is early childhood carriers. Uh, but this is not my topic today to talk about these uh, details. I would like to mention this as it is influencing our daily dental practice. What about the situation in young adults? There has to be mentioned the occlusion surface first. Um, I think a lot of us are knowing the problem of occlusion hidden carious lesions, where we see more or less nothing, where we see a brown discoloration and um, the bite wing radiograph is telling us completely the opposite, that we will see a deep carious lesion there. Furthermore, and the story is starting um, at the age of 12, the story of proximal carriers is starting there. You can see it here where, where we have a secondary carriers, a proximal carriers as well there, there as well. And this is a bite wing radiograph from a 15 year old boy. And the story is there, the carriers is present and um, we have to tackle this preventively. And of course, we have to manage several lesions um, operatively. And look on the right side, we see luckily only some few patients year by year, but we see these patients and that's a really dramatic situation. They look like uh, those children with early childhood carriers and I named these, um, these young adults, which are around the 15 to 20 or 22 years old as having early adult carriers. A lot of teeth are distracted, including the anterior teeth, and the pattern is the same than in these young children. There we, which means we need prevention, we need good strategies to tackle all of these problems. And if you had seen such situations, then you know how difficult it is in clinical uh, practice. What about the situation in adults and elderly? Um, there we have the problem of secondary carriers, it has to be mentioned, a lot of restorations will be replaced due to the reason of secondary carriers. And um, another important issue is root carriers. Um, with respect to an aging population, it is essential to recognize that elderly is becoming high risk patients. And please have a look on the story here. Um, this is a wisdom tooth, and three years later, the wisdom tooth was um, was extracted due to the huge caries lesion on the mesial buccal side. And two years later, the second permanent molar got in the same situation and had to be extracted as well. It is a dramatic situation in such patients, which are frequently um, using different medications, a lot of um, medications, and the risk profile is completely changed from an excellent situation to a worse situation. And from my daily dental practice, it has to be stated that there is a major reason for carriers. It is, um, and it's changed over the decades dramatically, that the major factor for carriers risk are not snacks and um, chocolate and cookies and something like that. It changed to juices, sugar, and rows of drinks. And 
effect, um, especially in uh, children and uh, young adults, it plays a major role and we have to tackle this um, with our preventive intervention. Let's talk about the current understanding a little bit more detail that um, I would like to talk about the etiology. What are the factors um, for getting carriers and carriers progression and what makes the situation worse or better? And then we should talk about first the so-called external factors, the factors um, which are influencing the social status, which are influencing the educational status, the attitudes and the knowledge. And uh, there's a simple paradigm which has to be repeated, um, or which, had, which was repeated over the years in many, many studies, that the social status isn't so very important um, variable and a high educational and a high social status is significantly linked with a much better dental health. The opposite perspective is that those um, which do not, which, those people which having a lower socioeconomic study, uh, status, they have a higher probability getting disease, getting uh, carious teeth, and this has to be recognized. It means at the end of the day that we have to pay much more attention to the risk populations, those who maybe do not understand what we, um, what we really want to get from the patient's perspective. And there we have to spend um, many efforts on that, that we will get a positive response um, with better oral hygiene and a better dental health status. That is the point is what I bring to your attention. We have um, the external factors uh, which we should try or could try to influence, but it is hard to get. Let's go to the inner parts, to the oral cavity itself. And there we have many protective factors and we have also um, carriers um, pronouncing factors. Look at the nutrition, maybe that's the important point in nutrition, which is linked with um, an acidic environment in the oral cavity will definitely influence the biofilm, will influence the pH level, um, maybe it's, it's decreasing and then the tooth um, will become demineralized over the time. On the other side, there are many protective factors. Um, we have the saliva, we have uh, those patients with a high flow rate, uh, high buffer capacity, good sugar clearance. They are a little bit protected, or they much more protected against nutrition. And very important point, which I forget to mention so far, is the microbiomics. The microbiological species, especially streptococci species, are able to fermentate um, sugar into acids, and it is resulting as well in a lower pH on the tooth surface, and um, over the time, a carous lesion will appear. If we are able to increase the pH value in the oral cavity and in the biofilm, and, um, and or remove the biofilm so that there is no probability that any acidic environment is um, developing, then it's a lucky situation for the patient as it's much more um, tooth friendly in comparison to those which are having um, uh, um, carogenic and erosive um, nutritional behavior. It means, in my eyes, nutrition um, is an important point which can be changed. Of course, we can provide appropriate fluoride um, supplementations, fluoride application, but from my, our experience, um, I have to state if the nutrition is not changed, especially in high risk patients, uh, the problem of caries is not solved. Let's go on uh, with the next point. Let's talk about caries diagnostics and uh, what um, is on our agenda day by day. First of all, there is very clear evidence uh, today that we can provide as a dentist a good and excellent visual examination that we will have specificity and sensitivity rates of around 80%. Um, 
And for that reason, Kim Eckstein stated some years ago that there is now sufficient evidence that caries can be diagnosed clinically, accurately, and reliably. As well as, and furthermore, on earlier stages, it means um, that we can see non-cavitated caries lesions and are able to detect them. Of course, there are some um, requirements which have to be fulfilled, um, but the important message is, for us as a dentist, we are able to do that in many, many cases. But on the other side, we should be aware of the hidden places of caries and we should try to enlighten this. But basically, visual examination is a very an excellent option to do day by day in our patients. And I don't want to talk so very much about the criteria um, which can be used in clinical practice. What it was established um, over the last decade are the ICDAS methods. Uh, uh, is the ICDAS method? ICDAS is standing for International Caries Detection and Assessment System. And the major advantage um, is that we can, or that non cavitated caries lesions were included, and non cavitated caries lesions are first visual changes in enamel, in enamel distinct visual change in enamel, and localized enamel breakdowns. Um, furthermore, the underlying dark shadow from dentin is frequently linked with an um, with and progressed dentine caries lesion. It means these stages we can assess clinically and this should be done day by day and we are doing this. For those who are much more interested in this system, um, I would like to refer to the ICDAS website as well as to the um, book which, which was um, written by Nigel Pitts some years ago. I would like to um, illustrate this a um, little bit with the carious iceberg. Um, what we can see clinically day by day is the peak of the iceberg. It means the cavities are visible and we see this, uh, we, see, we see these cavity cavities, but it means that we are seeing only the peak, that we are seeing only the peak of the iceberg and we are missing the body of the iceberg. And the major part of caries today, especially in young populations, is that non-cavitated caries lesions can be seen frequently and we have to detect them as we know these patients are at risk and these patients and these people have a higher probability that such lesions will progress. It happens today slowly. It is not a fast process. Of course, we have seen ultra high risk caries with patients where we see a caries progression within one year or two years from initiation unto the cavity. But this is not the normal situation. What we are seeing today is a slowly caries progression um, on the stage of non-cavitated caries lesions. And of course, um, um, caries starts sometimes. Um, it is sometimes also possible to detect the early caries lesion but it means there we have to carefully clean and dry the two surfaces so that we can see these stages. But it's important to note this and important to show the patient these early stages as it is a risk and the patient um, should know that, it, that he or she is not healthy anymore and the carrier's uh, process um, has started there. I will give you furthermore an, an interesting example um, to illustrate the underestimation of the caries burden by visual examination, uh, please have a closer look on the on the clinical situation. What we can see here are some few cavities. We see a, a dark shadow there. Maybe there is a shadow, but it looks like yeah, quite easy and quite manageable. But the bite wing radiographs are telling us a little bit different. Um, then we are seeing a lot of deep carious lesions, um, which are located um, close by the pulp. And it means these lesions um, are quite difficult to handle. Um, think about my next point, carious management. What we are doing in such situations, um, is it um, possible to handle such deep lesions or what should we do there? But basically, from the diagnostic perspective, it has to be mentioned that um, it could be possible that we underestimate the caries burden uh, by visual examination. 
And the first additional diagnostic tool is a bright wing radiograph. It's um, available in all dental practices across the globe, or mostly across the globe. And we have different points which can be fulfilled um, with the bright wing radiography. We see proximal enamel and dental and caries lesions. That's the domain, the, the major part of bright wing radiographs. Uh, look here on this bright wing radiograph as well. Um, this is the situation why we or why the bright wing radiograph um, is prescribed day by day. Furthermore, we can see occlusal um, dental caries lesions. It is also possible to see secondary caries or residual caries. And the major advantage of bright wing radiograph is that we can perform a precise assessment of the caries extension. That's so very important to know where the caries process is located, if it's um, close to the enamel dental junction or if the process is located um, nearby the dental part. And another unique feature the bite wing radiograph um, is offering to us, it is the possibility to monitor the caries process. And it's a good opportunity um, to repeat bite wing radiographs um, and to monitor the situation. Um, especially in caries risk patients. But there are, of course, some limitations which have to be recognized. Um, basically, several children um, are unable to cooperate when a bite wing radiograph is prescribed. Um, it is a resulting in such images which, um, which cannot be evaluated and assessed appropriately. We are missing information, and for that reason, um, we should perform bite wing radiographs in cooperative patients um, at its best. And furthermore, a disadvantage is that we see overlappings, um, especially in the proximal area. Here, it must be stated that these um, proximal sites cannot be evaluated appropriately, and we do more or less, no more or less nothing. Another issue is that we are unable to perform bite wing radiographs in pregnant women. Um, furthermore, it's difficult to perform bite wings in disabled patients, which do not cooperate appropriately. And um, last but not least, it has to be mentioned, the risk of um, dental x-rays. And there were a lot of discussions over the last uh, few years. Um, I fully know the studies and the arguments and pro and cons um, regarding this issue. But I think we should have a sound perspective on this issue and should declare that and should accept that X-rays will have a distinct um, risk and it could be better if we are not using X-rays anymore. And from the caries detection and diagnostic perspective, a lot of work was done over the last uh, years and decades. As you can see here, a lot of photo-optical methods and devices which were developed um, to, with the aim to improve caries detection and diagnostics in daily dental practice. But on the other side, it has to be accepted that several devices are more or less used and the others um, um, did not reach did not reach uh, the dental market and did not, re did not reach the dental practice at all. I think a new method which reached the dental market some years ago was the new infrared light transillumination, the diagonal chem device. Um, I would like to give you a short overview about this technology. It has to be understand, uh, understood as a further development of the digital fiber optical transillumination. Maybe this was a prototype um, 15 years ago. And this prototype was changed in two ways. First of all, the wavelength was changed. Um, the illuminating uh, light is now near infrared light, which is more or less invisible to the investigator or to us. And another change was that the light path was changed. And the tooth is not illumi illuminated anymore from the occlusion perspective. It is, uh, um, it is eliminated via the alveolar bone. The reason to use near infrared light is that it has a longer wavelengths and this light scatter scattering less. 
and therefore can penetrate objects much better. The mode of function is the following. Um, we have the camera device, which is um, um, which was made as a rubber tip, and there are the light sources, which are located at the end of the branches. Branches, and the light is go going is going via the gingiva, via the is, is going via the gingiva, via the alveolar bone, in direction in direction to the tooth, and the light, which is used for diagnostic purposes um, is um, is going via the roots of the tooth in direction to the coronal part of the tooth and in the case that there is a that there is a carous lesion the light is scattered and maybe some parts are absorbed and it means at the end that the light um, that the light intensity um, is reduced if there is a carous lesion present on the other side of the side if the tissue is, um, is sound, then the signal will be much brighter in comparison to the diseased areas. I will give you some. Um, I will give you some examples for enamel carious lesions. Please look here. Um, sorry, I need the pointer. Um, please look here. It is very clearly visible that we have an. Um, triangular shaped demineralization. Here the demineralization is shaped in a different configuration. Um, here as well there's a furthermore an enamel carus and um, furthermore um, on the right side is also the, uh, we have the same case. What's the difference in comparison to the to a dentine carus lesion? The difference is that the enamel dentine junction is um, reached completely that they are, that we cannot detect um, a bright line there. It means that the enamel dentine junction is completely involved um, in the demineralization process, and we know from our um, own clinical studies that those lesions are very clearly located into dentine. The question: What we are doing is completely different from the diagnostic, uh, from the diagnostics uh, today. But um, first of all, um, it is important to point out what we can see with the diagnostic device, and the interpretation is coming a little bit later. Yeah, what I would like to express is that if we see a demineralization which is um, crossing the enamel thickness in completely reaching the enamel dentine junction. This means that we will have most probably a dentine carous lesion present. We can see um, deep dentine lesions as well. And the uh, characteristics um, is that we see a dark uh, shadow in dentine as well, as we can see here in these examples. These are also deep lesions, and all of them were located in the inner part of the dentine, in the inner half of the dentine. It means it is close by the dental path, and um, in these cases, in those cases, urgent um, dental treatment seems to be indicated. I mentioned our own clinical study um, on the performance, on the diagnostic performance of the near infrared light uh, trans illumination, and I would like to skip to the results, to the asset values. And the important information is um, that. If we are taking the dentine carous uh, level, that we found an equal result in comparison to the bitrain radiograph. But there is one limitation which has to be expressed, and the point is that we cannot see the pulp with this device. It means an uh, accurate, precise assessment of the carous extension is not um, possible with um, this device for that reason. We will need the bite wing radiograph um, in case of any suspect um, findings. And this is resulting in our um, today's recommendation to use diagnostic devices. And of course, the visual examination will be ever the first step to investigate a, uh, to investigate a patient. And meanwhile, uh, in my hands, the near infrared light um, has got the second option. Because it is X-ray free, it is easy to handle. Within two minutes or one minute, I will get an overview. Um, 
about the possible presence of any enamel or dentine caries lesions. And if I see any suspect findings, then I recommend to add the bite wing radiography. And I think that this strategy should help to reduce the numbers um, of bite wing radiographs which we are prescribing day by day to our patients. I will give you in short overview what we are doing in daily dental practice. Um, look here, we have a young patient. Um, we see any plaque, any plaque, any biofilm. This has to this has to be removed to see the details of the tooth, to, to see the details of the caries process. And furthermore, as a second prerequisite, that this tooth was dried excellent so that we can see all the details um, to make our diagnosis. Yeah, forced air drying um, has to be added um, in addition to the tooth cleaning procedure. And then the second step, um, the second step of our investigation is to perform the um, near infrared light trans illumination and hopefully the video is now embedded um, on the screen. Thank you, Tom. And um, in this patient, we see our we see more or less um, we see more or less nothing. Please have a close look, closer look to the proximal sites. There is no demineralization present. Now we are going to the third quadrant, and um, here we see also nothing. There is also no demineralization. And you can see how fast this uh, diagnostic method can be applied in daily dental practice. Of course, some little experience is necessary. There's also nothing. Um, and this was a uh, near infrared light um, trans elimination within a uh, corroborative chart. It can be done within one minute um, and can be performed very easily. And is also well accepted um, by the patient. I show you a second example where we found um, several carous lesions and where I see the indication to perform um, bite wing radiographs. Please look here. There we have, here we have a restoration here as well. And there we have a dark shadow and it means the carous, carous lesion is present. And there we need also um, additional um, an intervention. The same story was true there. Um, there is nothing. This is the distal part uh, and the second quadrant. Now we are going here as well. Look here, there we see a dark shadow and it is clear that we need more information about this patient. Um, there was a demineralization um, which completely reached the dentine and I fully, I fully know that we need here uh, the bite wing radiograph to get a better impression, um, uh, to get a better impression about the situation. You see, um, it's an excellent screening tool, and we are using this frequently in our patients. So let's talk about caries management and uh, what is recommended today. And I can tell you, if you ask different experts, different colleagues, you will get so many opinions. Um, you will get so many opinions day by day. I would like to pro pronounce um, two papers which were published this year. Um, the, Europe, the European Academy of Pediatric Dentistry held um, an interim seminar on the topic of the management of early caries lesions last year in Brussels and a consensus paper um, under the lead um, by Falk Schwendicke appeared this year as well. Um, I don't want to go into detail and don't want to explain all the pathways which are described there. Um, but the main things um, which are under, discussions, uh, under discussion are the following. First of all, we have to manage the non-cavitated caries lesion and we have to um, develop a different, a different understanding for the cavity. It means the cavity needs different strategies in comparison to non-cavitated caries lesions. And the other topic and the other part of the discussion, especially um, which was expressed by Falk's group and uh, this group of experts, um, was that a lot of restrictive caries management strategies were recommended uh, for the industrialized nations as well. Uh, the filling strategy is, 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 seems to be not the first, the first 
um, choice anymore. It's a little bit different from my perspective. Uh, I'm thinking here a little bit more conservatively. Um, and I'm also not favoring um, hard techniques and non-restorative um, treatments uh, uh, for children and adolescents. But this is on the, on the discussion, and um, I see that there are a lot of discussions on this topic, and I would try to give you an overview what works clinically in our own hands. And therefore, I would like to give you a short overview about the management of non-capitated caries lesions. And there are two, mainly three techniques which, and three um, strategies which have to be discussed. First of all, fluorides, um, very important. I don't want to spend um, any time on that because this is um, basic dental knowledge. And um, new technologies um, should be mentioned here as well. The caries infiltration technique um, was um, introduced several years ago, and the indication is um, in non-cavitated caries lesions, especially on proximal side, it can be used on it can be used on um, on buccal sides as well. But the domain will be the proximal surface where we are, where, where it's very difficult to clean these areas, especially if the Premolar is present and we have a closed niche uh, where it's possible for the patient to brush and where the where dental floss um, is needed. And the caries infiltration could uh, create a protective layer over the enamel surface and is able to protect these lesions. And from the studies which were published so far, we know that um, we are able to safeguard 70 until 80 percent of all caries lesions at the current stage. It means um, the progression is the caries progression is inhibited, and that's a very good um, option with uh, to perform a very good option, um, which can be chosen for the patient to seal these um, to seal these um, lesions. I will give you an, an short example. Um, look here, uh, we have um, moderate caries risk patient um, at the age of um, 18. There we will have a D2 lesion, and there we had seen the indication um, to infiltrate and to arrest the caries process. Um, what we have to do with the caries infiltration technique to place a rubber dam, to place the wedge um, aiming to separate um, teeth uh, a little bit from each other those set so that the handling with a small matrix matrices is possible and in the next step the um, hydrochloride is applied for two um, for two minutes so that the outer layer of the carious lesion is removed and the pores of the carious um, of the body of the lesion is opened and so that the infiltrant um, can penetrate the caries lesion and fill um, and, the, um, and the metacrylate um, is uh, filling up the body of the lesion and um, so that the defect is repair is repaired. The infiltrant has to, uh, the infiltrant um, has to be applied for three minutes, which is um, a quite boring and uh, long-lasting procedure, but um, we shouldn't uh, reduce the time because um, several investigations, lab investigations, have shown that the time is needed um, to infiltrate the lesions appropriately. And you see, it's a very non-invasive procedure and it can be used. Um, and we are using this in daily dental practice, and it's an it's a good option. Um, to provide preventive dental care for our patients. <coughs> Let's talk about um, a little bit about putting fissure sealants. Um, it is fully known that um, sealants should be applied in care risk patients. They will have um, the greatest benefit from this preventive measures, from this preventive measure. And where we where the evidence is also there to uh, place or to seal non-cavitated caries lesions on permanent teeth. It is an effective measure. Um, it is an effective measure um, 
to arrest these brown discoloration and you see the one you control the sealant is there um, and it means this procedure is successful as well. What should we do with deep cavitated carious lesions today? And um, I would like to mention the important article where most of the discussion is originating from. This article was published um, 12 years ago, and the title was How Clean Was the Cavity Be Before Restoration um, by Edwina Kitt. And I deeply believe, and uh, I can tell you that uh, this article changed chirology dramatically, and the thinking um, is. And the article is influencing the thinking um, about carriers um, until today. Uh, the key issues were that um, Edwina Kidd performed some type of systematic review. She analyzed the available studies and um, compared the available literature uh, between restrictive carriers um, excavation and complete carriers excavation. And she found uh, that there was more or less no difference in the outcome. Um, but a major difference was there that um, much more pumps were opened if we are excavating the carries process completely. And she um, voted to be much more tooth friendly, much, much, more, uh, much more conservative with the carries process and she favored the restrictive carous excavation or incomplete carous excavation. And she pointed out that two um, points seems to be very important. And the first point is removing the biofilm. This means we should um, remove the gross, um, we should the gross biofilm. And in the second step, it is essential to seal the cavity that, um, that the, Carries process is arrested, and that there is no possibility that any sugar products will reach the remaining bacteria, and will enable a positive will a, will um, um, be the reason to speed up the carries process as well. And the benefits, as has been pointed out very clearly, and incomplete carries excavation is resulting in preserving pulp vitality, we avoid um, endodontic treatments, and especially in the pedo field, uh, we avoid maybe different, um, different general anesthesias. If we can be much more tooth friendly, much more conservative, um, it is possible to safeguard the pulp and to, um, to make it easier for the dentist and to um, to make it also much patient friendly and um, this is resulting that we do not need uh, so many GAs there. I have a case where, um, which I treated by myself um, sometime before. Um, this is a young girl, four year old, um, and this was the last tooth I had to treat. And in the moment I started to excavate, um, um, the patient told me that there is no chance anymore to deal with this tooth because it is um, sensitive, it is a bit painful. And um, the decision we, we met in this moment um, to place a calcium hydroxide liner and to place a simple restoration without um, um, with, a, with a fast track adhesive system. And um, two minutes later, um, the cavity was restored. And then we started to monitor the situation and what you can see two years later that the restoration got altered. Um, we see the margins and um, this is not the, this is not the situation we, which we can observe frequently in daily dental practice. This is a simple um, restoration where we use the simplified adhesive way. And um, one year later, um, the bite wing radiographs were possible. And what we can see, this is tooth 84, that we have a halo of a residual carious lesion. But it should be pointed out that this carious process is definitely arrested. And the same is true for the other lesions, where we, which we handled also um, in a very conservative 
way. And two years later, at the age of six, the patient got cooperative. Um, and then we decided to replace the restoration. You see here the leathery dentine, which uh, was excavated, and the, and the cavity floor um, remained, um, remained dry, remained discolored, but it is not completely solid. It is, um, of course, it is possible to excavate such uh, dentine. <coughs> But the main parameter in my eyes is that we have a dry carous lesion and um, or a dry cavity floor, and this was safeguarded in this moment. Um, then we placed um, calcium hydroxide liner again and replaced um, um, within some few minutes the final um, adhesive restoration. And what we observed over the time was nothing. Half a year later, the situation um, was nice. Um, one year later, the situation was nice. The, the pipe was not inflamed. There was no um, no pulpitis. Um, there was no pain, and the same was also true one year later. And this is a very excellent situation, and as we are doing frequently, and we can observe this result um, very frequently. And this is a potential of the <coughs> conservative management of the caries process. And um, we should use this to help the patients and um, to preserve the pulp and to safeguard um, the pulp and to avoid any endodontic treatment. <clears throat> what is the evidence for this procedure? If we are looking um, to uh, Falk Schwendeke's work as well, um, he performed a nice review some years ago and published this work um, and I can make it a little bit shorter and show you the forest plots um, where it is where there can be seen an advantage that a pulp exposure is less frequent, uh, probable um, if, um, if conservative, incomplete carous excavation is used. And another important point is there is no increased uh, failure for the restoration and uh, the tooth itself if we are comparing incomplete and complete carous excavation. It means um, incomplete carous excavation is a very strong option in deep carous lesion to avoid any endodontic treatment. Um, what should be mentioned is that different strategies and different methods were developed to help us as a dentist um, to excavate appropriately. And the first device, um, which was developed and which was introduced on the dental market was a carry salt. Nobody is using any more carry salt because it's um, a little bit impractical because um, it it needs many much more time in comparison to other devices, um, especially the manual excavation. Meanwhile, um, different instruments were introduced, um, the cerevers or the latest um, part uh, or the latest invention was the polyver, which was introduced on the dental market four years ago. Um, it's a plastic borer, it's um, one-way usage, but um, the intention to use this instrument is that the hardness is, um, um, is or has the same hardness of um, softened uh, dentine, dentine, and it means it, this removing this instrument is removing um, soft dentine only, and will um, will leave um, leathery dentine and remineralizable dentine in the cavity. And for that reason, such self-limiting carious excavation techniques should be used and should be favored um, in dental practice. In my hands, personally, the Hand excavators are a nice instrument, uh, which can be um, which can be used, especially in deep carious lesions, where we have the question to safeguard uh, the pulp um, integrity, or uh, to open the pulp and to perform additional endodontic measures. And the studies are there, which are supporting um, these assumptions. I think a very important clinical aspect is that we should learn to differentiate 
um, the carriers process into two areas. First of all, we should um, understand that the pulp is located there in the central part of the tooth and not in the periphery. And what is recommended to clean up the periphery? Excellent. And maybe in the in the, in the sense we have learned, um, or we, we have learned at the dental schools that uh, the margins should be clean at its, at its best. And uh, um, nearby the pulp, we can leave effective dentin and remineralizable dentin at all. That's important to point out. Um, and this aspect is influencing dental practice um, day by day. Um, let's talk about this, the second paradigm uh, from Edwina Kidd, um, which means to seal the cavity, to provide a good seal that we have a perfect um, seal and um, where um, the tooth got back the integrity and um, is not... Um, vulnerable to bacteria anymore. And in my eyes, this aspect, sealing the cavity, um, is definitely linked with adhesive technologies. Um, it means we, we have to use adhesive and adhesives and compromise or composite um, restoring materials. And um, in the hand, and in the hand, in our hand, um, we are able to manage also um, primary carious lesions. And you see, of course, that we, oh, I have to take the, uh, uh, the pointer, that we see um, that several lesions, several fillings will be lost over the time. But remember that um, we have made um, this investigation in a high carious risk population. Um, these children with early childhood carries is a worse selection of patients. and. We see, nevertheless, we will see that um, restorations will survive, but it has to be mentioned that we safeguarded uh, prevention and we um, forced the patients, the families, to avoid any sugar drinks, to, uh, to brush the teeth appropriately and to use fluorides um, appropriately. It means adhesive technology is um, working very nice in our hands and we are practicing this um, for decades and years, and the universal adhesives um, um, should be mentioned here as they simplified um, our practical life um, and shortened the application time. And these products are simple to use, and what we know from the studies so far that they are working quite nice also in the primary dentition. <coughs> Another important aspect in, in the adhesive technology is the usage of bifid composites, which were introduced also some years before in the dental market. Um, the major advantage is that we can place um, um, one in increments of up to four millimeter thickness. It means it simplifies the application process. And at the end, it's much faster, easier, and um, it has good aesthetics, especially also in the primary um, dentition. Nevertheless, it should be mentioned that we have two types. Um, we are using both flowables and packable bifid composites. And um, the clinical indication is very simple. Um, where we have a small cavity, I prefer also um, a small tip or a small diameter of the cavity tip. And uh, for that reason, um, flowables will be the preference in such small cavities. And if we have a larger cavity, um, then it's possible to, um, to use a filled, a high filled, packable bifur material. So it means clinical um, the clinical situation is influencing the choice of material a little bit. Um, finally, I will have um, one or two cases um, to show what we are doing with our patients. Um, here you can see the fourth quadrant. We see the cavity, um, some few small cavities on the occlusion side, and we see an opera, uh, proximal um, involvement as well. Um, I'm starting here with the proximal um, cavity where we see the caries process. Um, in the periphery, I normally use a steel bird to clean up the 
clean up the tooth uh, and clean up the cavity margins appropriately and to remove infected and non remineralizable dentine um, efficiently um, that I'm not doing with hand instruments at this moment because um, hand instruments need much more time and the indication would be to use hand excavators nearby the dental part. So um, we are going on with the excavation step by step. Um, then we are doing um, then we are doing the occlusal sites, and you see the clean cavity margins and the and the extension of the caries process um, and the extension of the caries process was in this case quite limited in relation to the part. Then we are in the next step. We will place a bonding agent, and um, in the present case, we used a biofilm material, and it was shaped and um, polymerized. And in the next step, the tooth four um, will be um, will be restored. You see the matrix, which is um, um, which was fixed with a wooden wedge, um, so that we will have um, a dry cavity where we can place the adhesive as well as um, um, as well as um, um, as well as the um, filling material. What is an what is an important aspect um, that I'm using just after placement um, of the matrix? I'm using the hand excavator frequently to clean up the margins um, of the cavity. It has the advantage that I can place some force um, in the cavity and there is no risk that I will, um, I, I will injure the surrounding tissue, the gingiva, and will provoke a bleeding. And for that reason, it's a nice issue to place first a matrix and then to excavate and to check the cavity um, again. Of course, polymer, um, uh, light polymerization is necessary. Um, the biofilm was applied, and finally, um, the cavity was or the filling was shaped and polished as well. What we are doing with um, our caries active um, patients, and this is the last part of my presentation today, my personal aim is that we will see such a situation where there is no caries, where we have a caries-free um, child um, or a um, six-year-old or a caries-free adolescent. This would be the optimal situation I would like to have. And this is a wish, knowing full well that wishes um, can be dreamed and will frequently not come true. And this personal aim is supported by the global aim of the Alliance for Cavity Future. And the global aim of this initiative is to have no cavities in, um, in 10 years. It is a very um, tough aim, but we should have such aims. Otherwise, we will not um, improve the oral health situation. And there are three major cornerstones which should be followed in my eyes and we are forcing our patients our parents our families to do that um, and I can tell you those who behave appropriately um, will um, will get uh, caries free or will be able to arrest their existing um, caries lesions the first part is to safeguard the tooth friendly nutrition it means to drink um, non-erosive, non-carogenic uh, products, and it means we need water, water, and water. And this is a must for caries risk patients. And in the case that they are not following this aim um, and this recommendation, we will see um, residual caries, we will see secondary caries, or we will see um, that the situation was not changed, especially in early childhood caries patients, um, that um, we perform a GA and we will see that um, one or two years later that many, many new lesions will be there. I think that's the major um, source, the major reason for the caries process, and this has to be changed by the patients. And furthermore, we have to control the biofilm. We have to do that. All parents have to do that in their young children. Um, as a child is not be able to do that. 
and the quality has to be safeguarded um, by the patient, uh, by the parents, and in the moment that the uh, youngsters are becoming older, it is essential that toothbrushing is supervised by the parents as well, so that the quality is safeguarded, uh, that the biofilm is brushed away and is not remaining on the teeth as well. And the, th and the third point is uh, the usage of fluorides. Um, I think that's an important issue which is known by the dental community at its best. Um, we have a huge potential of fluoride products and it should be applied um, um, on a home-based model as well as on a professional model. And um, knowing full well that different, different regulations and different recommendations exist um, across the globe. Um, I, um, it should be pointed out that toothpaste are the important, most important source of fluorides and um, in relation to the carious risk. Um, professional applications of varnishes um, should be applied as well. And it's very effective and should be used. But it, it should be also known that uh, fluorides that are, are not the solution for carriers. We, we have to tackle all three uh, points. We have to tackle the nutrition, we have to tackle the biofilm management by the patients, as well as the fluoride um, supplementation and application. Okay, then I'm really happy that I reached the end of my presentation just in time. Hopefully you enjoyed this a little bit. Um, but I would like to bring the summary to you um, that we need preventive dental care. Uh, we need a good um, diagnostics before we are starting to manage the caries process. And I pointed out that we need a visual examination, that the near infrared light transillumination seems to be a good second opinion. And of course, bite wing radiography is uh, needed as well. And regarding the caries management strategies, we have now a controversial discussion. We have many, many um, also extreme proposals what we shouldn't do or what we should do. Um, aiming to arrest um, carous lesions, cavitated lesions. Um, but there we have to see what the future will bring to us. But of course, it has to be pointed out that the potential is there to arrest uh, carous lesions on a non-cavitated state, um, on the non-cavitated stage, as well as mm, arresting carous lesions um, on a cavitated state, uh, state, uh, stage should also be possible. But it becomes a little bit more harder, and for that reason, restoring cavities um, is, um, in my eyes, an, an important issue and should be uh, practiced um, um, anymore. With a nice view from Munich, and if I look on, out of my window, this is the weather today as well, and we could have this nice image. Um, we could have this nice view over the town and I would like to thank you for being in the webinar and um, attending the webinar. And thank you very much for your attention. OK, um, there are two questions so far. Maybe um, I would like to encourage you in the case that you have any questions, you can go to the uh, left part of your screen. And there's a QA and a uh, part in the, ca in the case that you would like to have um, any answer on, um, on your question, please um, write um, this there and I can see this and I will try, um, I will try to give you an answer. Um, there's uh, the first part is um, the first question is not a question, it's a comment, comment. Great lecture, great pictures. Thank you very much. Um, the support obviously was, op uh, was also fine. It means, Tom, this um, is going to you at the Cable Academy. This means I can go directly to the second question, and I will read this uh, for you. In the case of incomplete caries removal, um, you were impressed by, uh, by the dry and cracked appearance of the dentine at the subsequent preparation. Is this a criterion of success, and is this a frequent finding? Thank you. Um, Um, yeah, um, again, what we would try to get on the cavity floor is um, 
um, normally to, dry, to get a dry cavity floor, which is frequently in the case of an more of an, of an active or non-active lesion, is frequently um, it's frequently um, discolored and uh, cracks. We normally do not. I normally do not see really. Um, uh, where it's possible to see any cracks, um, these are the teeth with big holes, uh, which uh, um, which have reached um, the majority of the tooth. There we see cracks, and it could be to see cracks on the diagonal cam image as well. And um, but over the years, um, it is not a, a frequent situation that we will see cracks and or are cracked enamel or cracked enamel and dentine just after cavity preparation. And um, for that reason, I cannot say so many things about this um, as we do not see this. And what we are seeing, and this is um, a criterion of success for us, if this tooth is um, healthy, do not have any pain, do not have any palpitis. And being honest, we do not check this regularly in, our, in the patients we are monitoring. We, we know that it works very fine. And um, of course, there are some special uh, cases where we uh, treated some deep carious lesions. And in these uh, situations, um, we, um, we perform a sensitivity testing um, to get the additional information. Yeah. And the clinical success is in our eyes when there is no palpitis if the, rest, if the restoration is present. Um, and furthermore, I want to see um, during the monitoring sessions that uh, the patient is plaque, uh, is free of any plaque, free of any biofilm, and is practicing good oral hygiene, and then I know that it works fine. This was the second question from the audience. Maybe if there's um, anything more, please write down your um, question. I think uh, we will be in line for one or two minutes. And um, if there's no question anymore, I would like to point out um, my thanks to all of you who, um, who stayed in the webinar. And um, maybe we will have the possibility to see you again uh, in the future. Um, Tom, I don't see any questions anymore. It means we are at the end. And um, again, thank you very much. And bye-bye. We would like to thank our speaker for sharing his knowledge and expertise with us today. We would also <coughs> like to thank our sponsor for making this online course possible. And thank you, our wonderful audience, for your interest and participation. The CE quiz is now available online on the course page and completing it will allow you to earn your ADA SERP CE credits. The recording will be posted online within the next 48 hours. You will receive an email notification with a link to the recording. Thank you again, take care and goodbye. Oh,